Hello and welcome to Mississippi Insight. I'm Byron Brown. Thank you for joining us. This week, the nation braces for more hearings and more testimony from the House Select Committee on the January 6th attacks. What they covered so far and are criminal charges against the former president and his supporters forthcoming. We'll get legal analysis from constitutional law professor Matt Steffi. And Shawnee Rickman from Mississippi Votes joins us. The nonpartisan group is doing what it can to boost voter turnout ahead of two key congressional runoffs in Mississippi. That's all ahead this Sunday on Mississippi Insight. We're watching the hearings by the House Select Committee on the January 6th riot very closely. Mississippi Democratic Congressman Benny Thompson is leading the panel. And a fourth and fifth hearing are planned for this coming Tuesday and Thursday, respectively. The first three hearings raise a number of key allegations against former President Donald Trump and some of his supporters. The bipartisan committee makes a case that Mr. Trump directly encouraged the January 6, 2021 attack on Capitol Hill through a speech to a crowd of supporters that day and through his social media post. Witness testimony and newly released videos show the Vice President Mike Pence was under intense pressure from the White House to nullify presidential electoral results and toss them back to state electoral panels. Mr. Pence refused to do so, even in the face of death threats by Trump supporters. Many of the top Republican advisors and officials in Mr. Trump's inner circle testified that he was warned that claims of election fraud were false, but he pushed those claims anyway. What's more, the committee says that a quarter of a billion dollars was raised by Trump supporting groups such as the Save America PAC by making these false claims before and after the riot. We want to dive deep into some of the legal questions raised by the committee's work and the potential culpability of the former president and some of his key advisors. Matt Steffi is a constitutional law professor at the Mississippi College School of Law in Jackson. We're glad to have him back on Mississippi Insight to talk with us through some of these tough questions. Matt Steffi, welcome back to Mississippi Insight. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, listed some of the key bullet points from the hearing so far, but what stands out for you as you watch these hearings in Washington? A number of things uh, stand out uh, to me. And these hearings are part of our constitutional structure. Uh, the House of Representatives drafts laws, considers and studies revisions to them. And so in its capacity as a lawmaking body, uh, it conducts hearings, usually not this high profile. And in its constitution, in the constitutional role of checks and balances between the president and the uh, legislative branch, particularly regarding uh, the election cycle, it is doing its uh, job to fact find, to decide what further action is necessary. Some of that action will, uh, may come out of the legislative branch. There are talked about revisions to the Electoral Count Act. And some may prompt uh, the Department of Justice uh, to pursue uh, criminal investigations. But what stands out to me as part of watching the constitutional process unfold is a number of things. One is that Benny Thompson seems a particularly appropriate member of Congress, uh, to, not just because he chairs the Homeland, Homeland Safety Commission, Homeland Safety Committee, but also because his whole political career has involved the uh, uh, the fight for uh, electoral legitimacy, for participation of African Americans, for the sanctity of the right to vote. So I think there's a certain symmetry to that that is notable uh, from here in Mississippi. More broadly, the 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 thing, the recurring themes include uh, one is I think uh, Vice President Pence emerges as a stronger, more esteemable uh, central figure in all this, that he stood uh, against enormous pressure based on principle. Uh, and he's really the, the central point around which the successful transfer of power pivoted. Had he been, had he succumbed to the pressure from President Trump, uh, this could have been a much different, much messier uh, outcome. I think he emerges uh, with a certain amount of uh, esteem with his character facing down a mob calling for his head, steps away to be committed to doing his constitutionally appointed role, a role that comes out of 
the 12th Amendment, and that comes out of uh, uh, legislation dating back to the 19th century. So I think the role of Mike Pence, his commitment to principle in the face of danger stands out. Um, in a less honorable way, almost the flip of the coin is how deplorably, maybe too strong a word, but unethically unprincipled John Eastman comes out, uh, that he proposes a theory that in private conversations he knows would not pass constitutional muster. He is the voice in his ear, along, in the president's ear, along with uh, uh, Rudolph Giuliani. So, Matt, well, we understand that the, the former president wanted uh, Mr. Pence to reject electoral counts in his role as the presiding officer over the confirmation process. Does the U.S. Constitution even give the VP that sort of power? No, oh, absolutely not, which is the conclusion that um, Vice President Pence came to, that all the advisors around him came to, and that nearly everyone around President Trump came to. That uh, the arguments to the contrary are thin to the point of pretext. Everyone in Washington, with very few exceptions, understood that the Constitution does not give to the outgoing vice president the single-handed power to determine the outcome of the election. That is so profoundly undemocratic that it, it's mind-boggling. It's the sort of thing we would expect from a corrupt authoritarian regime that where election results are ignored um, based on the will of a single person, much less a single person who is himself running for re-election. Well, two names that have come under scrutiny in this probe are John Eastman, which you've touched on a little bit, and Jenny Thompson, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, Eastman first, let's touch on this. He's the attorney that pressed President uh, Trump to send the electoral counts back to the states. He pleaded Fifth Amendment uh, protections against self-incrimination over 100 times when the committee tried to question him. Uh, from what you've seen, is there a case for criminal liability against Mr. Eastman? Oh, I think there's certainly a case for a criminal investigation against Mr. Eastman. I think I'd want to, to a more a fuller look at the, all the evidence um, before I concluded whether we ought to go to trial. But a criminal investigation, absolutely. The there are comments by Mr. Eastman uh, uh, to uh, other insiders that he didn't even believe what he was arguing would hold water in a court of law. That it was pretext. And so if he knows what he's saying is false, then I do think that there is criminal liability. And there's nothing that says, I know uh, I'm doing something wrong than asking for a pardon before the fact. They say, no, you've got the authority to do this. But by the way, could you just kind of give me a get out of jail free card on the way out of town? Uh, so I think there's a, a strong uh, uh, evidence that he knew uh, what he was saying was false which would give uh, his actions the union of criminal act and criminal intent that could result in charges. Uh, meantime, it's been discovered that Jenny Thomas uh, communicated frequently with Eastman, Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, and others in Trump's inner circle, uh, discussing how the 2020 election might be overturned. Talk about how complicated this probe becomes if a wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice comes under scrutiny. Oh, it becomes extremely complicated, and we might see her take the fifth 200 times if it comes to that, because when uh, John Eastman says that he's got in, an insider telling him that the Supreme Court is all roiled up by an issue, that would likely be Jenny Thomas. And that's something the committee would like to ask her. Is she a conduit between John Eastman, I mean, between her husband, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, and John Eastman and Trump's inner circle in, in, in giving some uh, inside look at the mind of a Supreme Court justice. That becomes unethical. That becomes uh, uh, unsightly. Um, it, it becomes, it, it gives this incestuous idea about an autocrat's desire uh, to hold on to power. If, it's, if this has to happen through the back channels and in the face of an uh, election 
voting him out of office, and in the face of everybody of stature in Washington uh, saying that the election was lost, uh, it becomes an unsightly picture. Uh, and I think if we expect our branches of government to, to perform their role of checks and balances, um, this is uh, a troubling development. We heard testimony on Thursday from retired Judge uh, uh, J. Michael Ludic, a Republican. He advised Pence about his role in the January 6th vote count. And he told the panel that the uh, continued rhetoric by the former president and his allies present, uh, present a clear and present danger to democracy. So given the direction the committee has taken, what do you see as the end game here? And are they presenting enough evidence to hold Mr. Trump accountable? Well, I think there's a, a, a few layers to that question. Is there enough evidence for a criminal investigation? Yes. Is there enough evidence to pursue criminal charges? Well, that would depend on Mr. Trump's intent. Did he know that the arguments he were making were false and pretextual? If so, like with Mr. Eastman, there would be the union of criminal act and criminal intent. That said, even if one thinks that a crime was committed by the president, one has to weigh whether it is wise to have these issues play out in a criminal trial. Because a criminal trial is absolutely likely to be divisive, drawn out, and if we learned anything from the impeachment of Bill Clinton, is likely to have political backlash. And so I think there's a lot of components that go into answering that question. But I do think there's a factual basis to believe a crime was committed. And I think there is a factual basis to investigate whether Mr. Trump committed, President Trump at the time committed a crime. Um, and depending on that investigation as to whether Mr. Trump believed what he was saying or not, uh, then decide on whether a criminal prosecution is warranted. But if we have never had um, a criminal prosecution of a former president and given how sharply divided the country is, uh, it, it's a difficult development. You would like to prosecute a former president with kind of a broad um, bipartisan consensus, not have it look just like one party using the criminal justice system uh, to settle a score. We expect the committee next week to shed light on the former president's pressure on some state officials, including Georgia election authorities. Does the Constitution address attempts by federal elected officials to pressure state officials to tweak election results? I don't think the Constitution does, but constitutionally enacted statutes do. And so do statutes in the state of Georgia. So there's also the possibility of the constitutional structure of federalism coming into play for former President Trump facing criminal charges in Georgia for an attempt to corruptly influence an elected official. But there are federal criminal statutes on corrupt influence. They are enforced all the time. And asking an elected official to take an illegal action for one's own benefit is unquestionably both a federal and a state crime. Whether that happened here, I think, is what we're going to, uh, what we hope to see more about next week. When this is all said and done, what do you think the Justice Department is likely to do? Will anyone be held accountable, or will this kind of all just go away uh, in the months and years to come? I, well, I think there will be further criminal charges, whether it reaches all the way up to the president or not, is an open question. But I do think there will be more criminal charges that get closer and closer to President Trump's inner circle. Whether that last step is taken, and even whether it should be taken, I think it, it's it's just too soon to tell. That's Steffi. Always a pleasure talking to you and good information and good insight. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. And we'll be right back. We are just nine days away from two key congressional runoffs in Mississippi, and our next guest wants to be sure that you can make uh, your voice heard in the vote. Shawnee Rickman is the deputy organizing manager of Mississippi Votes. It's a nonpartisan nonprofit that promotes civic engagement and educates communities on voting rights in Mississippi. 
Shawnee, welcome to Mississippi Insight. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, tell us about your group and what it's doing this year to boost turnout this year and this year's congressional race. Uh, uh, this year, we'll be launching our Up To Us campaign on actually Juneteenth. So on our um, thing, we'll be launching our um, Up To Us campaign. And with that, we'll be partnering with several uh, uh, organizations and making sure that we have people all across the state of Mississippi getting registered to vote um, as well as having political educations with them and different events to gauge people in their communities as well as college and high school students. Yeah we don't have exact numbers from yet from the Secretary of State's office but turnout from the June 7th primaries uh, was very low yes. uh, and you uh, do you expect more people to vote in the uh, third and fourth district GOP runoffs on Tuesday? Uh, yes uh, we are trying to um, you know make phone based Banking and text banking to get people more engaged and aware. Um, that's a, a really big part of our organization, just making people aware of, of voting, because a lot of people do not know. And I know when I get in contact with people, they're like, oh, I didn't know election was going on. So it's one of our things to just spread out that information for people. If they didn't vote in the primary, can they, can they vote in the runoff? Yes. Yeah. Explain how that works. Um, so even if they didn't vote, so I know a few people who haven't, if they have like a runoff election just for those candidates, just go to their um, their polling precincts. If they don't know where those are at, we have those um, information on our website as well. So just go into like their polling precinct and be able to get um, put like for whoever's on the uh, on the ballot and get that done. And I know a lot of your work focuses on young voters and yeah. historically speaking that's a demographic uh, that has a great deal of interest in election around po for politics. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your biggest challenges in boosting young participation? Um, one of our biggest challenges is just really getting like in contact with the young people. So we do that with our program. So we have our youth, uh, um, youth advisory council, which focuses with our high school students as well as our democracy in action uh, fellowship. And that's with our college students. So we have fellows um, on each uh, college campus as well as our targeted counties for high schools. Um, and we have those students engaged with their peers. And that makes it easier for us to get the young people more involved um, and also build their relationship with our organization organization and when as they get older you know potentially join our organization and work with us full time. What motivates young people or why don't aren't they motivated to vote? Um, I think young people are actually really motivated to vote. I know a lot of young people that I've engaged with, they, are, they want to be informed and they want to know how to get through the process. Um, I just know from like personal experiences like with me being from Illinois, it's, it's just hard for like having people tell you that information. So when I when it came to me registering to vote, I actually had a, a high school teacher who was like, hey, you guys are 18, get registered. And I realized that a lot of people down here, they don't have that. So that's one of our main focuses of like trying to help people because they, they do want to know. I have friends and family that are like, I'm, I'm 18 now. How do I get registered? And that's the first thing I do. The day they turn 18, here you go. Here's that information. Uh, turn it in. And there's other um, things that are going on, especially like the ballot, uh, the ballot process and things that are going on in the ballot um, that people are going to get engaged in when it comes to education or health care. And that's an easier way for them to get um, informed and engaged with that. So is it issues that young people are more concerned about or yeah. is it the candidates that they're concerned about? Issues. And so when it comes to the issues, just figure out what candidates, what they are for um, and uh, what they're against. And then that will like, help break down the process of who they would like to vote for. Yeah. Uh, we're coming up on, we're taping this on a Thursday, but uh, later on Sunday, we have a big Juneteenth celebration Sunday. So yes. talk about the celebration that's going to be on Sunday and, and what's going to be going on. All right. Well, we'll be having a Juneteenth event on uh, Ferris Street from 2 to 8 p.m. We'll be having a lot of live performances, activities for the kids, a bounce house, face painting, getting people People register to vote and as well as launching our up to us campaign and letting them know where we'll be um, up until election day throughout all of the counties and where they can find us and how they can get involved with our organization um, we will also be partnering with several different organizations um, across the state as well uh, mainly in the Jackson area such as uh, Mississippi and uh, NAACP one voice um, Midtown law office is a long list, um, but we'll be partnering with those people and getting resources out to the community. Is the goal to make get people to really get out there and vote come November when the general yes. election comes? Is that yeah. what you're really working towards? Um, yes, that and just like making sure that people are registered, that their information is up to date, um, and letting them know that you know what our organization stands for and how they can figure out how to get registered, as well as knowing where their polling precincts and keeping them up to date what 
what elections are coming up. Is your focus in the metro or are you all over the state right now? Oh, we're all over the state. Um, we are in Starkville. We're every single college campus in Mississippi. Um, and then we have our target areas that we mainly focus on as well. And how, ha how have you increased as far as voting participation since you've been an organization? Um, for voting participation, um, I know for sure that we've, we've registered over 30,000 um, individuals since 2018 um, with our National Voter Registration Week. Uh, that's one of our really big projects is getting people registered for that. So those, um, that's one of them. And then just when it comes out to like voting, keeping people aware. So just going to the college campuses when it comes to election day, making sure that they're going to the polling precincts, um, connecting with other organizations, getting people, you know, driven to the polls and trying to keep the, the turnout up. All right, sounds good. Shawnee Rickman, yeah. Mississippi Votes, <laughs> thank you for explaining and joining us. Thank you. All right, and we'll be right back. Our thanks to Matt Steffi and Shawnee Rickman for joining us this week. We'll be back next weekend with more of the political and current affairs coverage that you demand. I'm Byron Brown. From all of us here at 12 News, make it a great weekend.